Ask if I can share my screen because I do have notes at the bottom part of my presentation. So I would like to go via that process. Um, but I don't have access to sharing. Um, participant sharing our screen has been disabled. So please, if I can have access, I'll be glad. Sure. So should you share for you that the screen or you would like to share it uh, yourself? I would like to share myself. I just want to be sure if everybody can um, see me or hear me. Yes, we can hear you. We can see you. Okay, so if you can see my screen, let me know as well. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, Clear. great. Yeah. Fantastic. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Velvita Viban. Um, you can call me for the purpose of this call, V, um, for short. Um, I'm originally from Cameroon, but I like to call myself uh, a global trotter, <laughs> a daughter of the soil. Yeah, so I, I come from everywhere. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much just a brief description. Velvita is um, a gender activist from Cameroon. I run a social enterprise called I'm Human, um, which celebrates and promotes inclusion for everyone, regardless of you know background, race, gender, um, religion. So specific to this call, I'm particularly excited because we'll be sharing a little bit of my work, just a little bit, but pretty much insights as to you know our journey so far and our understanding of. Um, of what you know, um, sexual violence is, of what uh, sexual exploitation is for children. I was hoping, of course, that Harun was going to go ahead and, and do an introduction for us just to explain context as to what you know, sexual exploitation means and why we're talking about you know, harnessing the role of you know, faith entities in, in, in curbing this. But specific to my presentation, um, I just labeled it think talk, tackle. So it's a triple three approach to um, how we can collectively um, help solve um, the issue at hand. So um, as you can see, so pretty much I would say, let's go with the first T, right? The first T we're going to be thinking about the various possibilities through which violence can occur in our settings. And I'd like to precise that sexual exploitation can happen in multiple settings. It could be, we don't even know that it's happening around us. It could potentially be, and according to you know, some definitions just for context purpose. Um, it's where, you know, especially for children, it's where you're taking advantage of their vulnerability. And sometimes people can use either luring methods, either finances, you know, just to lure them over. And so for this purpose, let's think about Mary, right? Mary, let's assume that Mary is a seven-year-old girl who is living on a farm hut with her dad who's a widower. I'm sure, you know, there are some people who can relate to that, but let's think about Peter, an 11-year-old who, be sent on vacation to work with his busy uncle. Now, potentially what can happen in such scenarios. Now we're going to be thinking about, you know, the possibilities of what, what kind of exploitation can be happening here so we can identify and see it because sometimes we don't know. So for instance, if we're thinking about Mary, right? If she's living on a hut with her parents, obviously she's going to work on the farm. As a seven year old, she's exposed to a lot of manpower, a lot of man labor, and she's not as strong physically as let's just say her father who's working on this farm. So potentially she's from a poor background. And if there's anybody, say whoever the owner of the farm is, is making advances at her, her chances are, you know, she's in a vulnerable position and she'll probably let go. Let's just say, for instance, Peter, who is the 11 year old that we're talking about here, who's staying in a busy uncle. Most of us here, some of us are parents. We send our kids to our, our 
uncles or our relatives' homes for vacation. Now, if your relative is very busy, is a very busy uncle, what are the possibilities of you having a child in such a setting? And the fact that there's no adult attention being paid to this person. So they're potentially at risk of anybody coming to, you know, deter them and lure them. And at the age of 11 or so, there's only little you have as knowledge of what you know what the rights or wrongs of how people should address you now let's think about anna a three-year-old who follows her abuse mom for bible study every day to church right every week we go to some people for those of us who are faith entities or from different christian backgrounds let's assume that you have a child that is following you um to church every single day but then you know you're, you're a parent to, an, to a child, but you're living in an abusive home. So what is what, what are we teaching a child in such a setting to think of us, knowing fully well that the church is supposed to protect, prevent, and promote some level of shelter and create like a safe heaven for these children? Now, if I'm following you every day as my three-year-old self, what do I get to see? What do I get to acknowledge? What do I get to accept? And that's potentially putting me at risk of further expectations because I will learn to accept um, certain things. Now, I'm going to be talking about the case, let me just say, of 14-year-old Volantin. And please, these names are just random names picked. These are not specific cases. Um, um, so let's just assume with the, co the coming of COVID, I know for a fact that a lot of schools, um, especially in areas where the education system has, you know, evolved, a lot of children are in the space where, you know, they're learning remotely. There's online for areas where education has, you know, evolved for, you know, it's at, a, at a high level and there's a lot of technology. These children are being exposed to a lot of things. So a 14 year old who is called to do assignments online, do a lot of research online. You can only imagine the exposure of what is going to be coming her way in terms of what she's seeing online. You know, there's exposure to sex crimes, online bullying, requesting, you know, for, for you know, People online even request for pornographic pictures. People will bully you into certain things. And these are the risks that every single day children in our communities are facing. So if I can go with Cameroon or just in general, over 50% of sexual and gender-based violence across you know, the two crisis affected regions of Cameroon, because we know we've been having, for those who don't know for context, Cameroon has been and in a political instability for the past five years, they've been on and off back in school. There have been a lot of uh, militant groups, you know, but, so th there's been a lot of instability for the past five years in the English speaking regions, which include the Northwest and the Southwest region. So in Cameroon, for instance, 50% of the cases that we face, especially regarding sexual violence, you know, and physical assault, uh, you know, in, uh, in those areas. and. To top it off, 30% of those cases of the victims that were reported are children. So if I'm if I'm saying that we have 50% in a particular group, like we have 10 regions in Cameroon, and there are two regions which re are recounting for about 50% of these cases of sexual violence, rape, and exploitation. And 30% of that population is children, which means that. 30% of children, in, in fact, if you want to do the numbers for the whole of Cameroon, you probably be more will be accounting for more than just 30%. So the 30% of these children are exposed to, you know, violence and assault, and it's alarming. So, I mean, Cameroon has been labeled, especially in these areas, the Northwest and Southwest regions of Cameroon, it has been labeled, our crisis has been labeled as one of the most complex humanitarian crises. because there's a lot going on in the back that we cannot necessarily pinpoint to. There's food issues, there's hunger, there's sanitation, there's water shortage, there's, and recently we're dealing with a cholera outbreak. So on top of everything else, kids are being forced out of their homes. They're dealing with violence, constant kidnappings, and people are asking for, you know, rewards and ransoms. And 50% of the children, if we can say, have reportedly um, been abused physically, sexually, and emotionally. Now, I know everybody, when you think about sexual exploitation, maybe you're thinking about 
um, rape, but then sometimes the, the emotional side of things actually comes to play before anything physical eventually happens. So 700,000 children in Cameroon, especially in the English speaking region of Cameroon, are at risk every day of facing violence. And when you're at risk of facing violence, the chances are you're, you know, you're potentially exposed even further to anything that anybody is telling you. So somebody can come and pretend to be your caretaker and can want to you know, provide some level of support, but you'll be assuming in your mind because you're in a vulnerable position, you're going to be taken advantage of. And we're dealing with tons of unwanted pregnancies, early child marriages, and you can name the rest. According to a sample survey, most of the sexual violence cases we've experienced are in between the ages 4 to 15. So that excludes me, if I can put it that way. But then I'm thinking about my five-year-old self. I'm going to school on a regular, and nobody is telling me that I'm at risk of anything. And I'm going to school on a regular. And if you want to think about it, what am I doing to provide, you know, Delta, or at least help myself. So if I can just say, in, not to read over everything, you can just go through the screens. For most homes in Cameroon, children are forcibly advised to keep quiet. And our sexual you know, abusers and perpetrators are in our homes. Some are in our churches, our pastors. I know people don't like to address that, but that's the subject that we'll be talking about today. When the pandemic hit, for instance, with the crisis and many people were recourting to churches and local prayer homes, I know that in Cameroon, many people were running to the church for shelter, for food, for feeding. Now, to this context, to bring it to context why we're talking about you know, the use of faith entities and the reason why we're important actors here is that many faith institutions are acting to play the role. So imagine 700,000 children in the north, west, and south regions of Cameroon. I'm sure there's some Cameroonians on the call. So imagine there are 700,000 children who are looking for some level of shelter, feeding, support. So this means that the faith institutions that are there, be it Pentecostal, Catholic, Presbyterian, you name it, right? regardless of what um, faith you, you belong to. These institutions are meant to provide some level of shelter for these children, right? And if I can just say in the same light, the way we think about, you know, um, doctrines and how the doctrines in church work. If we're looking at the children aged between the four to 15, which are the highest number of those who have experienced sexual violence or assault or have been abused and are at risk of exploitation day in, day out. The ages four to 15 fall between children who are potentially going to be either taking baptism classes, taking Holy Communion and Confirmation classes, you know, you name it. So the church is the go-to place, right? Where we can potentially place our messaging that will help, you know, these children. So being able to address the subjects at hand, we've thought about the potential levels of how we can talk, you know, we're thinking this child, this person, we've laid out the potential scenarios. Now let's talk about actually how we're going to go about it, right? We need to be able to address violence without it having to label it as a taboo subject. And I know that many people always feel that there's a need to hide the subject, especially coming from a church. If I can use the example of the Catholic institution, I know there's a lot of protection in the amount of information that we share, even in churches. I admit churches shy away from um, having these sexual conversations. And, you know, even in schools as, you know, even as ministers, right? Even as many as church ministers, we should be able to punish some of these perpetrators, right? We should be able to welcome survival conversations. We should be able to have parents and child conversations. We should be able to, as a church, we should be able to include these conversations and have peer-to-peer -peer conversations as well. That would enable people to feel a lot safer when they are addressing some of the issues at hand, right? 
um, I don't like talking over myself. So if you are agreeing with me, you can just raise your hand. So I know I know that you're you're with me, right? So we've talked about we've thought about the potential areas. We're thinking we're we're talking about getting more victims to express themselves. What are we doing as institutions to welcome some of these conversations? Just like a business, I'd like to say that the way the government also has conversations on setting goals and targets for for institutions to implement SDG goals. I think that we as you know faith institutions, it's our job to sit behind and you know talk about the policies in place. How many churches, I'll just ask, how many churches do we think or institutions or Bible study institutions, do we think have sessions or policies in place for reporting and punishing perpetrators? Now, if we don't have policies in place, I don't know about Cameroon per se, we have a faith um, minister on the call who will be sharing, I think maybe after myself, and he'll be sharing his experience as well. But that's an open question, right? Faith institutions can act as relay points to for safe reporting. Like institutions and businesses, I think that it's important for us to deliberate and dialogue and set targets for promoting these goals, right? And for instance, you know, use the church as centers. I know we have, um, for instance, in the Presbyterian Church, there are centers where we, you know, there are health centers that are being set in place to help people just to access basic health care. Now, those are potentially, so if you have a church of about 2,000 people, what we're saying is that that health center can be a potential safe haven for about 2,000 people, and our messaging can you know, go through there and these areas can act as emergency hubs for victims to report and to find themselves some shelter. And we require everyone, I mean, I personally think that we should require every single one of us who works in direct contact with children and youth in our institutions, whether they are paid or whether they are volunteer to complete a child abuse prevention training. This way we're sure that the people who are in direct contact with children on everyday basis know what are the boundaries that they should be, you know, they shouldn't cross as individuals. So in tackling, you know, um, sexual exploitation, especially in this side of Africa, from my experience, I've been able to work on the mentorship program that has reached approximately 3,000 girls across our 11 schools in Cameroon, Kenya, and Nigeria. One thing I noticed about talking to girls in schools is the fact that they want to come to their school institutions, but they're not sure whether this is a safe space for me to come and talk about these things. And whether we like it or not, if your student is in school from Monday to Friday, what we're saying is that half, more than half of their lives, they're in, the, they're in the school institution. So I think personally that we need education reform and innovation, and we need to include, you know, sensitive conversations like this. I know, I went to a Catholic school, so I know that sometimes it's, it's a little irky. We don't have these conversations as open as we have them, and we often rely on conferences and speakers to come just to offer talks and mentorship program, like what we have been doing for these schools to be able to address the to thank you to be able to address the subject. And I think also that you know, as we're talking about it, especially with val cases of violence against children or violence against young girls, I know most of the times we men are not very open to having these conversations. And one of the things that we've been doing as an organization, um, if you can check us out on our website, you'll notice that last year's campaign. Um, again, on 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, we were actually using men to do the talking. So we want more men to be part of the conversations. Ministers, parents, fathers, school teachers who are male, your people. And we need to leverage on the media. Now, when I say leverage on the media, I think that as faith institutions also, those of us who are here on board, what are we doing to have radio programs? The same way we talk about our faith on the radio, the same way we broadcast you know, the Christianity, the same way we broadcast Muslim values. I think that as faith entities, we can incorporate radio programs on our on our different platforms, social media, and even traditional media that reaches the local communities to address this. And just to end um, pretty much, you know, I think it has dial we need to have a dialogue between institutions and set targets for religious institutions to have conversations. So on that note, um, 
I would just like to encourage all of us here to be part and parcel of the conversation and ask me any questions you want on the work that we're doing to incorporate, encourage, and, and encourage young girls to stop um, sexual violence in their communities to report these cases primarily because we don't, if they don't report, we would not have this data. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from, you know, other speakers how they think that, you know, the role of the, of the faith institutions and other, you know, Christian institutions around us regardless can help us to to end or curb, you know, sexual exploitation and NGBV against girls. So on that note, I would like to say thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Velvet. We highly appreciate for your presentation. Thank you for sharing the current state, uh, the current state and best practices in combating sexual violence against girls with a case study uh, in Cameroon. Thank you for sharing the key points concerning the role of male champions and also the importance of opening spaces in learning schools and also in religious institutions. We highly appreciate for your presentation. So the next speaker will be Mr. Moses Uyang, who is from Nigeria. Mr. Moses will also share we also share a current state of sexual exploitation in Nigeria and share some best practices and recommendations in the role of religious leaders and faith communities in ending sexual exploitation. So let me give, uh, give it over to Mr. Moses. Also, let us know if you would like to, to do the presentation alone or you would like us to help you to do the presentation. Yeah, help me to, to screen. Okay, sure, no problem. So back to you, you have 15 minutes from now. Take over, Moses. All right. So I await the screening, please. Okay, okay, let's do it this way. Don't worry. Okay, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. I am glad to participate. I am not a pastor, but I am coming into this meeting from the humanitarian point of view because of my experience working in the humanitarian field, as well as having some experience in religious education. So um, I want to thank Delveta for her presentation. She spoke very well, and uh, some of our most or all of our points are really things that we need to help ourselves, to help our children. Okay. So can you just leave it, don't screen, don't, just leave it, don't screen it again, stop it. Yeah, stop it. Just allow it, allow it. Can you hear me? Yes, you can just proceed, uh, no problem, we just okay. help out. Okay. Yeah. So I, I will begin from uh, a quote by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He said, to protect our children, we must talk to them about rape. Can you go to the next slide, please? Aaron? Hello. Oh, all right, thank you, thank you. To protect our children, we must talk about rape. I am starting my presentation on this uh, foundation. From the introduction, Faith communities have come to stay and they are seen in most of West Africa as custodians of positive social values. Annessing the unique role of faith communities in ending sexual exploitation and violence against children in Nigeria, therefore, is a call for more concrete action to be utilized in this fight. It is important to note that 
since those that make up faith communities are products of the cultures of the land, coming through these cultures and then through faith, we yield more lasting successes. In a sense, the latter would mean that tapping from our cultures, which see children as special blessings to their family, and from, for example, the Christian Bible, which says, uh, uh, but whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a milestone were hung about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Therefore, stakeholders are encouraged to learn how to make their teachings and advocacy more pragmatic while also enlightening their audience using terms they are more familiar with to explain the faith. Let me talk about uh, culture and religion a bit. We cannot, we cannot overcome the issue of sexual violence against children if we don't understand the culture of the land. We cannot talk about God if we don't come through the culture of the land. Because before, let's say for example, before as a Nigerian or as a native Nigerian, uh, before I come to know about God, I knew first about where I came from. I knew first about my culture. And children are closer to what they know best. They learn most from things that they know best. So as um, we try to tackle this issue of uh, violence against children, we must map out ways in which we try to explain these things using our culture. Like for sure in every African culture, children are highly respected. In every African culture, children are seen as special gifts from God. And if, for example, as a preacher or one that is into such advocacy and as a Christian or as a Muslim, we use both the, uh, the, the, the good values of our culture that talk about children, then explaining it also using either the scriptures or, or the Quran, we see that most likely we get more impact in this uh, campaign or advocacy. Next slide, please. Yeah, from uh, the CIA World Facebook website, they stated that religious belief in Nigeria, we have 40% uh, Christians, 10% indigenous beliefs, then uh, Muslims, 50%. And uh, as I observe here, I said um, from these statistics by CIA World Facebook, it is in place to point out that for success to be achieved, announcing the role of faith communities in ending sexual exploitation and violence against children in Nigeria will be a network of efforts in which faith communities must be bold enough to take the moral lead. This is so because many Christians or Muslims in Nigeria consider, consider the opinions of their faith leaders as superior to that of any other person. Thus, their influence in bringing about success in, in the fight against violence and sexual exploitation against children. Um, if, I don't know if this could be the same case in other African countries, uh, by thinking most of the African countries I've been to, they pay much homage and reverence to, to men of God. And uh, that's not bad. That is very good. Now, how do we take advantage of this uh, respect that the people give to, to, let's say, religious leaders, both Muslim clerics or Christian clerics? 
How do we take advantage of this moment? That is to say, everything you say, every of your action has a very important role to play in stopping violence against children. Take, for example, uh, when, when the Pope says something all over the world, every Catholic is in place by whatever the Pope says, or from the part of the Muslims, whatever uh, they hear from their Imam or stars always has great influence on the followers. So I think as those that are men of God must not abuse this, this privilege, must use it to the advantage of the community. And there, there is something very important to note. When we talk about a uh, faith community, we're not just talking about Christians or Muslims. There are lots and lots of faith communities around the globe and around West Africa. So in this case, I might be concentrating on Christians and Muslims, but we are not limited to that. And we should know that these other faith communities also have great influence on children. So that is that about this uh, statistics. Can we go to the next slide, please? So on, on this next slide, I said something. I said there is need to create more safe spaces for children, where children can express their fears and abuse. So I think Velvet has said something about this. And if faith communities will be these safe spaces, faith leaders must avoid being the opposite of the morality they preach, and faith communities must be homely for all. We must note that faith communities has, have sorry, two important roles, not just the role of practicing their faith, but they have the social responsibility of taking care of the community, both the men of God as well as the, the congregation. Everyone is a stakeholder in this business. And I would like to quote what uh, Ade and Kalu said in their research. Uh, they, they made some recommendations in regards to sexual harassment of children. And I also strongly noted that these recommendations, however, can still be adopted by other faith communities. Even though these two authors are Christians, supposedly they are Christians, these their recommendations can as well fit in, in every faith community and even non-faith communities. So the first one here, they said, uh, sorry, uh, churches should encourage their members to be alert and diligent and do all they can to protect children from child abuse. Churches should teach their members to be aware of children of child abuse and to alert law enforce, enforcement agents and church leaders if they discover any child in danger. And also churches should intensify efforts in teaching moral values to the younger generation so as to stop cases of teenage pregnancies and child uh, abandonment. Next slide, please. Also said um, churches should sanction any of their members found involved in child abuse. Churches should develop more robust strategies for caring for abused children. Churches and government agencies should establish functional helplines and uh, instruct members of the public to call immediately the land of any case of child abuse. Parents should be sens sensitized to give birth to the number of children they can cater for. And churches in Nigeria should collaborate with government agencies for effective implementation and rehabilitation program for abused children. So the next slide, before I talk on the next slide, um, 
what the, the last slide has said is talking about taking re responsibility, everyone acting with a sense of urgency and responsibility. And as they pointed out, no one is left out in taking care or in protecting our children, both father, mother, pastor, the priest, whoever, every member of the faith community has a role to play. So the next slide now, please. On, there's a diagram. I came up with a diagram. Aaron, please, the next slide, diagram. Just go up a bit back. No, no. I think the fourth slide, where we have the diagram, back. I think I don't see a background from from my from my side. A diagram, a diagram. Yeah. Just go I, back. You passed it. I saw it. You just passed it. I think is is that the the place? No, just keep on going. No, no, just go, return back as if you're going back to the start of the slide. Just go back one after the other. Go back. Uh, from my side, it, it does not see, I cannot see the diagram, so you cannot, you can just explain okay, it. Calm down. Just calm down a bit. Let's go one, two, three. Okay, come again. Come again. Just continue, continue. Oh, wow. Okay, let me just give what I have here. Uh, I came up with a diagram in which I said, the diagram below presents some forms in which faith, uh, faith communities in Nigeria can use their role to end sexual exploitation and violence against children. On the diagram, I have right books, I have the use of social media. I have uh, physical community campaigns. I have the use of the pupit. I have also uh, the use of radio and TV and also families and personal, <clears throat> personal conversion. I wish um, Aaron can show us the slides so that we understand a bit what I'm trying to say. So the slide is there, it's not missing. So go back, because I'm seeing my own here. Uh, hello, Moses. Uh, from my side, I cannot see the diagrams. Maybe it's just some technical issues. So you, you can yeah. just uh, proceed and explain it, no problem. Okay. okay. Okay, like I said, we could make use of uh, those that write books, those that uh, are good in writing. This is another way of propagating uh, our agenda against uh, the practice of exploitation, sexual exploitation against children. Also, we have opportunities to, to, to carry out physical community campaigns. We also have opportunities to use the social media. And uh, of course, we all know that this is the age of social media. and. Uh, that is a big asset to the current faith community. I must say here uh, with some sense of authority that any faith of, uh, community that is not using social media now must really be lacking behind. And there is a lot of things that you are missing both for your community and for the members of your community because that's another venue, avenue where well, you could use to propagate whatever you have as a faith community. Also the pupils, those that are preachers, you use as well the, pup the pupils. We also have radios and television. Uh, Velveta said something about that, which is excellent. And of course, our families, they, our home, in our homes, that is where we first practice whatever we want to go and preach. 
in our homes. So when we talk about uh, sexual exploitation, violence against children, those that have children must first of all, make these explanations clear to their children at home, discuss issues that are uh, issue, issues around uh, exp sexual exploitation or violence with your children so that they get to understand these things even before they, they go out to meet, uh, to meet the society. And finally, of course, individually, our personal conversion as individuals, our personal conversion is very, very important. Because no matter who we are, no matter the faith community that we belong to, if we are not converted as individuals, we cannot be effective in carrying out this advocacy. So that's that on, on this uh, diagram. Thank you, Aaron. I can see the diagram now. Sorry for putting you through this difficulties. So the next slide, please. Then I said, uh, Possible challenges to the success of annexing the unique role of faith communities in ending sexual exploitation and violence against children in Nigeria. First of all, I noted that faith community leaders being sexual predators. This would be a big hindrance to the success of campaigning against sexual exploitation. Then also lack of organized faith communities. Once there is no organization in any faith community, I don't think there will be huge success in the campaign against exploitation against our children. Then lack of proper channels of communication to report cases of abuse, silence of abused children. Um, like this fourth point, it's very important and also very troubling to, to think of. Why? Because many of the young people at the moment, they don't have that freedom to talk about their problems in the faith communities or with their faith leaders because a safe space hasn't been provided for them yet. However, there are some faith communities where we have young people, children who freely have that freedom to share their problems uh, in terms of, let's say, abuse that they must have experienced. And then if they are not provided with a safe space, then it is a challenge. Success in campaigning against this would be a challenge. And another point I said, uh, not talking to children ab about things like uh, rape, just like what uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, that when we want to protect our children, we talk to them about things like rape at all, so that they understand this first time from their father, from their mother, or from their elder siblings. And the last one I talk about, the absence of adequate government policies, like, if we don't have policies that protect our children, then uh, people, predators, they are most likely to act with freedom. And that is dangerous for the society. So um, one of the things I think as an organization for Aaron, for you guys to do is to, and also everyone listening, in whatever way you could, you push for opportunities or avenues where uh, governments create policies, strict policies that will protect children against predators. Thank you. The next slide, which is the final slide. To conclude, I said, faith communities have a strong influence in ending sexual exploitation and violence against children in Nigeria. Nevertheless, awareness creation in this regard cannot be overemphasized. The success of this campaign begins with having clear awareness creation strategies <coughs> excuse me, 
putting into consideration the nature and way of life of Nigerians. This takes us back to my earlier comment. That is, we must understand the nature and way of life of the people if we must win the war against uh, sexual exploitation against children in each of our various communities. Then one of the authors said something that he came while he said, while it is true that Nigeria boasts of the largest Christian population in Africa, <clears throat> the same cannot be said of other religions. Considering what I now said, I said, considering what Ikenwa has said, I believe that the advantage in the large population of Christians can, if properly utilized, be effective in bringing about success against sexual exploitation and violence against children in the whole of West Africa. Number play a lot of role in achieving whatever advocacy we want to carry out, either positively or negatively. In whatever case, <coughs> when a Christian community or a Muslim community or, or any other faith community has a good number that are well informed, then we can proudly say we are in safe hands and our children, children are also at advantage because of the great uh, number. Finally, I said uh, collaboration and respect among established authorities and faith communities will also be significant in bringing about an end to sexual exploitation and violence against children in Nigeria. So on a final note, all these things we are doing boils down to collaboration. Whatever you're doing, you cannot do it on your own. You must collaborate with the government. You must collaborate with existing organizations that are into this kind of advocacy, or you must collaborate with individuals that are having that have experience in issues like this. With this, I think we will all be successful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Models. Uh, thank you for your great uh, contribution to this conversation. Uh, thank you for sharing some of the religious beliefs. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, some recommendation in how some religious leaders should open up some religious centers as a safe spaces uh, for children to come to express uh, themselves and be engaged. And thank you for sharing more concerning using the interfaith approach uh, in addressing this matter of combating gender-based violence and child abuse. We highly appreciate and thank you for lastly sharing concerning promoting collaboration, building bridges towards addressing common, the common agenda. Actually, this is the main conversation we are having now with focus in North Africa and in the next few days also we'll have the same conversation with experts from the Horn of Africa. And finally, we'll try to monitor the key trends in Africa and see do the, do the religious leaders play their role in combating gender-based uh, gender violence? What are some areas we need to improve and how can we collaborate for the better future? Thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker is from Nigeria. I would like to invite Omotoke to do presentation. Omotoke, are we together? Good afternoon, everybody. I hope we can all hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. All right, um, I will, can you help me with my slides? Um, both speakers have done um, good justice to the topic, and um, I'm just going to start with this um, recent scenario that we have in the country. Um, I'm sure most of us have heard about the death of um, this popular 
singer in Nigeria, um, Otunachi, who died, I think, on Thursday or Friday, if um, I could remember. Please, pardon my background noise. I'm in a public space at the moment. I have to bring my car for the um, vehicle inspection. So um, I couldn't do, um, um, do without it. And, um, you know, why a lot of people have come out to say different things about, um, oh, she should have spoken up. Oh, she should have left. Oh, she should have done this. And she is a singer. She attends a church. The pastor should have known about it. And we had a lot of options. We had a lot of advice. We had a lot of things, you know, flying across the internet. But I have these three questions because you know, we are talking in respect to faith-based um, organization. And this is my first question. And I would like us to answer it in the comment section. If she had left a church, right, and she divorced the husband, will you still invite her to your church as a minister of the gospel? That is the first question. If she had divorced the husband and you know it has become a public news, will you, some of you here that are Christian, will you say, oh, yay, that's the right way to go? Or you go about say, oh, she didn't emulate um, a good Christian attitude. And that is the foundation. That is the very beginning of how, you know, domestic violence has come to be. And how this violence has not only been on the mother, but also on the children. You know, recent um, news that came up um, spoke about um, how the children are also even part of it. So when the man is done beating the wife, then he jumps on the children. The children observe their father beating their mother. Now tell me, these children who has been in this kind of um, environment, in this kind of, um, in this kind of upbringing, how do you want them to grow up? to become responsible adults. And so my um, presentation mostly is focused on the role of the faith community in ending sexual exploration and violence against children. Last year, um, I had the pleasure of working with GIZ um, and then we were doing um, a Southwest mapping of you know, irregular migrants and um, how they come to be. And I observed that most irregular migrants are actually women. And most of these irregular migrants, at the end of the day, end up in sex trafficking. At the end of the day, a lot of them end up in this situation. Now, the question is this. If you check the, the statistics, most of these people are also Christians. How do we end up in this situation? So gender-based violence is no doubt like a culture in Nigeria, especially in the northern part. In the northern part, you will hear a child of 12 years old is getting married. You will hear a child of 13 years old is getting married. And you know, when we talk about gender-based violence, we should not only talk about um, physical abuse in terms of beating. We also have other vices that goes on, you know, in the community. Um, about two years ago, we, we learned of a, a um, senator, a senator in the house who went ahead to a sex toy and she met a woman there who has a child. And well, we don't know what happened, but at the end of the day, camera took it up that the senator, a whole senator, was beating this woman with a child, you know, giving her multiple slaps and everything. And at the end of the day, this man went ahead to canvas and still went for the second time. Isn't that funny? 
So the, the question here is, are we really, um, are we really doing what we are supposed to do? Are we really, really fighting against this gender-based um, violence? So I need to leave where I am. The noise is getting too much. So the, the, the most important thing is that most times what happens is the victims, they are scared of talking. And I think we've seen that so many times. And we've seen this play in so many cases, you know, where people come out to say, this is what I am passing through. This is the challenges that I have. And then the next thing that people say is, it's because you've done something to the man, right? It's because you abused the man. It's because you did this and this. Mike, it's because you did this and this. That is why the man, you know, retaliated that way to you. So, um, so what are the roles of faith communities in ending gender-based violence in Nigeria? In an effort to eradicate gender-based violence in the society, there are prominent organizations who have come up with programs. They do trainings, they do investigation, they do report gathering, you know, majorly just to ensure that they get the actual problem that is wrong and how to do it. Please, the next slide. Um, The um, so we also can also influence masses through teaching and acting as role model. The next slide, I want to talk about this case study that I have. Um, there, yes, I was talking about the GIZ um, program that I did, and after we've mapped about 30 shelter homes, these shelter homes or house people who are victims of um, sexual violence sexual trafficking, irregular migration, and what have you. And most of you, these people, I can tell you, they are actually seeking for greener pastures. And that is what makes, um, most of the time, people who are victims of, you know, sexual trafficking or gender-based violence are actually women. Because they are seeking for greener pastures, they are seeking for better life, they are seeking for better things to do. And they go ahead. I've mentioned the case of this popular singer, Osinachi. No, news came up yesterday again that the man has actually been married before. And this woman is just like a money pot. So the man takes her money. The man takes everything. Now, the question I've, I've been asking myself in all of this is, is the church not aware of this? I am sure the first person that this woman would have spoken to would have been the pastor. What has held this pastor from intervening in this situation? And what would have made this woman endure this hardship, this punishment up to this moment? And you know, one of the things that came to me was that the fact that the society, we, we the society, we do not support people that are gender-based violence. We might come for trainings like this, right? But after trainings like this, we go out there and we post things that make it difficult for people to come out, to talk about their, their woes, talk about the situation that they are passing through. You know, it's good to do research, it's good to talk about the statistics, it's good to talk about the number of people who are suffering. The question About is, four this, minutes. you and what do you say? You have you have four minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. The question is this: you and I, as individuals, you go to a church, right? You go to a more definitely you are affiliated with one religious body or the other, you are affiliated with one religious based organization or the other. What are you doing in your church to do this? I remember when I was growing up, one of the things that made me draw closer to gender-based violence was seeing the rate at which women, you know, left their marriage and they just go. At the point, I was, what would make a woman to leave her home, leave her children? And then it dawned on me that most of the times, the first person people report 
their issue of gender-based violence too is their pastor, is their spiritual elder, either an imam, either a pastor, either maybe an ifa priest or whatever. That is the first person they report issues like this too. And most of these people, um, they are in the process of either preaching, you can preach on it. If you don't preach on it, you can help this woman with separation. You can, I, um, in my other slide, I talk about the fact that you can give them shelter homes while working on separation. I have some churches, for example, we have Don Bosco, we have um, the Sister of Perpetual Light in Nigeria, which is a Catholic organization. They have shelter homes that they provide for women who are fleeing sexual trafficking, who are fleeing gender-based violence, children also who are fleeing, you know, all these violences. They have homes that they give to us, give to them to stay for a short period of time. Sometimes it could be three months, sometimes it could be six months. They also take them through training. So these are things we should also try to inculcate. Maybe in your church, you could bring up this. And I think each church teach should have a, a division for this, whereby you take care of people that are victims of sex trafficking, gender-based violence, and what have you. So that when people come to our church, they find it as a source of comfort. You know, I, I read of a case whereby somebody told them that whenever their husband beats them, they should read Psalm 91. Or whenever their husband beats them, they should fast the following day and read Psalm 91. I'm like, okay, fine. The, lead, the woman is reading Psalm 91. The woman is fasting. What is the church doing? What are religious organization doing for the man? Because this is a two-way street. As much as we are particular about the women who are victims, don't forget that these women are not just victims of what they do themselves. They are victims of what the male, the other gender, is doing to them. So, like I said, my question is it today again. I hope we will not become one of the spectators. I hope after this, we will take it upon ourselves to provide support, to provide love, to provide empathy to provide affection for people who are passing through this and they will be able to give them tangible support in the future i don't jump on trends i've seen a lot of people when something is trending we all want to give a view about it we won't we all want to say something about it but i tell you some of these um, gender-based violence issues some of these sex trafficking issues are deeply rooted in culture in tradition and in religion and I say this, government, also, no matter how much we want to talk about faith-based organization, we should not also forget our government. Because most times, if governments make a law, a policy, and implement it, it's much more easier for faith-based organization to take this up. For example, if government should just make a law that faith-based organization should report, they must report. So that if we know a member of your church who is going through gender-based violence and you didn't report it, the church could be closed down. The, the pastors could be sued. The minister death could be sued. I'm telling you, we will see a change. Everybody must be held accountable for what they are doing. I hope I've judicially spent my <laughs> remaining four minutes. Um, Aaron? Yes. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much, Omotoke, for sharing your key insights. Uh, thank you so much uh, for also sharing your experience, some key findings from mapping of illegal, uh, illegal female trafficking and exploitation. We highly appreciate for your presentation and for your engagement. Lastly, now we have the last speaker who is Reverend and Dr. Tala Blais from Nigeria. Uh, Reverend, he will sharing uh, with us some best practices and dive deeper on the role of faith communities in curbing exploitation and violence against ch children. As a Reverend, you have observed the conversation from our previous speaker. Some have been recommended some good practices in how we can adopt the interfaith strategy and how we can bring uh, faith communities on board to address this matter. So Reverend, share with us uh, what is happening in Cameroon. Share with us what is happening in your region. And also share with us some recommendation in how best we can make sure that the faith communities are in the forefront 
of curbing these kind of challenges in Western region. Back to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Bishop Tala from Cameroon. Uh, I am, uh, by the grace of God, the General Vassier of New Life Gospel Synagogue and also a humanitarian worker because I run uh, an organization and uh, we are focused on gender-based violence, uh, child protection, uh, entrepreneurship, and in fact, development uh, as a whole. So it is a pleasure for me to, all right, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. It's a pleasure for me today to participate in this uh, discussion panel uh, where I'll be sharing the best practice and uh, give some little more insight on the, what role faith communities can actually play in curbing sexual exploitation and violence against uh, children. Okay, I hope uh, we are all seated. So the first thing I'm going to take on with is, uh, I'm going to look at the definitions so that we can situate ourselves. Please, can we go to the next slide? So that we can situate ourselves on the, what is a faith community? Because I believe that when the terms are clear, it becomes more easy for us to communicate and understand ourselves. Now, generally in Cameroon, uh, we have four uh, types of uh, faith communities. So a faith community uh, is a community of people that share the same religious beliefs. Uh, for example, we can talk of uh, African uh, traditionalists, uh, all of them, all, that, uh, all of them, they may be diverse depending on, because Cameroon has over uh, more than 200 tribes, ethnic groups, and each of them have their, their beliefs, their, their you know, traditional religious system or setting. But the common thing about them all is that they believe uh, that deceased humans and uh, animals exist in a spirit world and they have the ability to sometimes influence what happens uh, in our day-to-day -day life. That's why they get involved sometimes in ancestral worship, in pouring of libations and things like that. So this is very common to most countries, uh, most tribes in uh, West Africa. Then the next community group, uh, community, uh, faith community uh, is a, a, a Jewish community. What puts them together? They may be different from different orientation, different denominations, but what they have in common is that they all believe uh, in the one God who has a covenant with them or with uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we have the Christian community. Also in the same way, uh, we have different denominations, uh, different orientations. And, uh, but what they share in common is that they believe in the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah who died for the salvation of humanity. Then all finally, we have the Muslim community who also believe in Allah uh, as the one and only true prophet, uh, uh, true God, and in the prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, uh, as the last prophet of Islam. So uh, the importance of understanding this is to be able to know how uh, these various groups that fall within these different uh, faith communities can network together for more effective, more effective action at the grassroots. Okay, please, can we move to the next slide, please? So I want us to look at what is so unique about uh, these faith communities when it comes to curbing sexual exploitation and violence against children uh, in the African context. Now, the first thing uh, that uh, I'm looking at is that faith communities in Africa are the most developed and interconnected form of organization. And I think it's not just in Africa, it's in the whole world. Uh, Afro Barometer, which is a Pan-African uh, non-partisan survey research network, came up with the, after research, it came up with the findings that nine out of 10 Africans identify themselves with a religion. That is to say 95% of 
Africans identify themselves with the religion. And what this means is that you can find or you will not find any community, any village, any, uh, any setting of people anywhere in Africa without actually finding a, uh, a religious group, which is definitely a part of a larger faith community. And that alone is uh, a very solid, uh, let me say ground for greater work at the grassroots. So what this actually means is working uh, or getting stakeholders. When I talk of stakeholders, I talk about the government, I talk about uh, non-governmental organizations, I talk about uh, international entities that all work on this subject of sexual exploitation and violence, getting all of them to actually acknowledge the important, the important role that faith communities can play in this fight is very, very necessary. Because anywhere, anywhere you go, you will find a faith community. Next slide, please. Let's look at the second thing that makes faith communities unique when it comes to this, uh, this uh, struggle. So, some previous uh, speakers have mentioned this before. I think uh, Viban spoke about it and Moses as well, about the respect that we Africans, we attach, the trust and respect that we attach to our religious leaders. Africans, we see religious leaders as messengers from God, and sometimes even as representatives of God, or as people we can go to in order to find out about uh, what God has to say about any given situation. So this makes it that religious leaders in Africa are very much respected, very much respected. And uh, being very much respected means that the things they say is taken seriously in terms of their sermons, in terms of the counseling they gave, uh, in terms of the instructions. Why, like the why the talk so? Are we there? So when we talk of uh, uh, faith or religious uh, leaders being that much respected, we mean that they have the capacity to reach out and to influence attitudes, behaviors, and to actually change you know, change cultures. Yes, they have that capacity. And when we say they have access to the community directly to have the capacity to talk to the community, we mean they talk to everybody from ordinary citizens to political leaders, to businessmen, to women, to professionals in different fields, parent, children, youth, and so on. So this makes it that at the family level, at the community level, and even at the national level, religious leaders have the power to raise awareness, influence attitudes, change behaviors, change uh, practices, traditional practices, and even influence state policies. Now let's look at the different assets that uh, faith communities uh, can bring to the table when it comes to uh, curbing the fight, uh, curbing sexual exploitation and violence against children. Now, number one, we, we have uh, spiritual assets. What this means is that they have the potential to promote a spiritual mandate to protect and nurture children. Now, what do I mean in practical terms? The way we as religious leaders interpret scriptures can be geared in such a way that we lead our members not only to build you know, the, the desire or the, the the desire to someday live in heaven or access eternity, but it should also be for them to become actors in the social life of their communities and nations. So when we begin to uh, form lessons, discipleship lessons, training lessons, begin to modify our sermons in such a way that we can be injecting some of these concepts, making our people to see that the value of a child and the protection of a child 
is not just something that is good, but it is something that has eternal value because it is a direct command from the very God we worship. I think that is going to go a long way to influence behaviors and change attitudes. And depending on who we may be talking to, because some of the people we are talking to, some of them are in government and some of them may be in government tomorrow. And their belief system will influence the policies that they're going to make for the nation. So we have a very important role to play. That's why we talk of the spiritual assets. Then secondly, uh, the next asset that is available to religious leaders is the moral asset, asset. We have the potential to break the culture of silence and secrecy on the issue of sexual exploitation and violence against children, especially when this is happening in our own faith communities. We must not be afraid to speak up. Okay, for example, um, we had a case of uh, sexual, of actual, a case of rape that was reported to us, I think that should be about a month ago. By the grace of God, the sentence was given yesterday, which is a great victory to our effort because we actually stood our ground. We went to lengths and heights to make sure that all those involved in that matter got to understand not only the implication on, uh, 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 on the person that had, on the victim, but also on the implication of society and also on the ability of uh, 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 the, the court and the decision makers to take a decision that can deter such actions in the future. So the verdict for that was passed yesterday. The, the, it was an issue between, uh, it was not actually a child, it was a lady of about 23 that got invited by another young man They were living in the same community, uh, just like come and visit me in my home. And when she came there, the young man forced himself on her. So when the case was reported to us, we, we had to take it up and see how we push it legally. And the young man was sentenced yesterday one year imprisonment with a, a cushion of two million francs to be paid. So we really saw that as victory. And this, we keep talking about it, even like next Sunday, we are going to talk about it so that those that are listening to us may know that we are not for such. And if they had any such in the back of their minds, obviously they should actually uh, be able to change that. So we have the moral responsibility to be able to stand for, uh, uh, for the protection of, of children and for the defense of victims when it comes to uh, sexual violence and exploitation. Then the second asset, the third asset, sorry, is the social asset. We have the potential to promote uh, practical social actions and services in relationship to children in our schools, in our hospitals, in our youth centers, because most of us, our uh, religious organizations have all these uh, cultural industries like the five minutes, like, we have remained with five minutes. That, that, uh, that opportunity to be able to set up safe spaces like uh, uh, Viba and uh, Moses mentioned, set up space, uh, safe spaces, even though this is very difficult for one particular congregation or one particular group to handle, but when it, it, it has to do with the entire faith community, that's to say, let's take for example, the Christian community, when it has to do with different churches in that environment coming together to do that, the burden becomes uh, lighter. And I think we can do that. All right, please, next slide. How many minutes do I have left? Five minutes remaining. Eight minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. Now, I want us to look at some great quotes for reflection. Uh, the first is from Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa. He said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. I think the same can be said of our religious communities. There can be no keener revelation of the soul of a religious community or a faith community than the way in which it treats its children. And uh, Hem Ginot, which is a child psychologist said, children are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. In other words, the things that children experience today may last for a lifetime. And Louis Pasteur, which is a French chemist and microbiologist said, when I approach a child, he inspires in me two sentiments, tenderness for what he is and respect for what he may become. So the way we treat children today has a lot to do, not only with 
in the future. So we should be very cautious. Now, I want to share uh, two uh, passages of scripture so that I can show you more practical ways how we can uh, leverage on the, the biblical text in order to push through with some of these things. Now, the first passage I'm sharing is Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. It reads, it says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So in this passage, God is saying, every child we see out there is on a mission for him. What this should tell us is that an attack against God is, an attack against a child is an attack against God. And scientists have discovered that sexual exploitation or sexual violence can modify brain functions. So most children, especially those abused and left untreated, may never regain mental equilibrium. Some will be condemned to live with a persistent feeling of sadness and hopelessness. Some will be condemned to live in constant fears and worries. Some are drowning in the feeling of shame and guilt. And Natalie Martin Salem said, in less extreme circumstances, after a stressful and threatening situation, the parasympathetic nervous system takes over to, uh, to reduce stress hormones and brings uh, your brain back into equilibrium. But in a case of traumatic sexual abuse, however, the sympathetic nervous system continues to release stress hormones, fatiguing the body and mind. So what the scientist is saying is that an abused child may never be able to find the necessary energy to question he or his existence and discover purpose in this world. So what would the perpetrator ever tell God? That what happened to that mission carrier that is sent to the world and who was not able to find the energy to question his existence or our existence and be able to fulfill the purpose for which he or she came. And uh, first Samuel says, if you have a case with a man, God can intercede. But if you have a case with God, who is going to help you? So that's a question for reflection. Now, the next scripture is Psalms 127 verse 3. It says, Lo, no, children are an inheritance of the Lord. So what this scripture means is that God gave us children so that we may have a future. A child is the future. Without children, no one will know we ever came. Children are the future people. They are us in the tomorrow. So Dr. Zhu said, adults are just outdated children. We were once children. So we need to be able to look at children, not only with, with, with uh, kindness, but also with the ability to understand that someday they will also become the adults that we are today. So when we abuse, break, or fail to protect or fail to restore a broken child, we destroy the possibilities of tomorrow. If we care for what the world could become, then we have every reason to care for children because children are the tomorrow we have, we have been called to build and protect. Protecting children is not a religious suggestion but the very foundation of all true faith. James said in James 2.18, that someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. It is in our works that the true merit of our religion are seen by men and evaluated by God. So as religious leaders, we must take responsibility for future outcomes. We must let our members know that it is faith that saves, but it is our works that will justify our eternity. So Jesus in Revelation 22, 12 said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according to what his work shall be. So as best practice, these are uh, five uh, practices that I think we can implement as religious leaders to see how we curb this uh, issue of sexual violence and exploitation against children. Number one, religious leaders should use religious texts as a spiritual basis for the education of their members on children's values and rights. And I just did some examples some uh, few seconds ago. Number two, without any form of considerations, religious leaders should speak out publicly for the prosecution of perpetrators of sexual exploitation and violence against children as a religious, as a strategy rather, to deter potential offenders. Because if we don't speak out, even the Bible says, when iniquity is not speedily punished, even the righteous is tempted to put his hand to evil. Number three, religious leaders should educate community members on the provisions of the law 
relating to sexual exploitation and violence against children, as well as on the available referral pathways. Like with us here uh, in Cameroon, uh, especially in the Southwest region, we have established a, a network that brings together uh, legal practitioners, government officials, religious leaders, uh, members of the civil uh, society, in order to be able to fight for these things. So anytime there is such a case and it drops into that network, all the actors get to work and we push through until we have lasting and uh, expected results. So number four, religious leaders should advocate for the criminalization of all forms of practices, religious or cultural, that may amount to sexual exploitation or violence against children. And number five, faith communities should put aside prejudices and synergize to create and finance safe spaces with religious communities in every geographic locality. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I hope I was able to edify us in this uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Reverend. We highly appreciate for your for your presentation and thank you for diving deeper in this conversation and share some of the key religious thoughts and some of the best practices and recommendation. Thank you for this great quote, which said that uh, God gave us children so that we may have a future. A child is the future and all of us, we have responsibility, especially the religious communities have the great role to groom these children at a very young age because all of us have been, uh, we've been part of the same stage uh, and the same journey. So I think we have remained with very few minutes. We have remained with, with around 25 minutes to end up this session. So uh, I've seen a lot of message in uh, chats. I would like to give some few minutes, maximum of 10 minutes for some participants to share their main thoughts, question, and to trigger this conversation further. So if you like to share, or if you have any question, feel free to raise your hands and we'll give you opportunity. So the first person I can see, I can see Damaris uh, wants to ask a question, recommendation. Damaris, you can mute yourself and talk. Yeah, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are having this conversation from. Um, Damaris from Nigeria, I work with Women Environmental Program, a women focused organization. So it has been a very interesting conversation. Uh, all the speakers are fantastic. Well, I want to just uh, say two things. One is about issue of policy. Uh, when we're talking about issues of uh, child protection or child self guiding, we really need to take issues of policy seriously and also to enlighten people who are caregivers or who are saddled with the responsibility of taking care of children to also understand the key policy uh, situation so that when they are committing crimes, they should not see uh, ignorance as an excuse to, to whatever crime they are committing against children, they should be punished. Uh, and then secondly is the issue of um, abuse marriage and um, i know that you're familiar with what is happening in nigeria regarding the, the death of osinaji so i want to ask this question to the religious leaders on on this uh, conversation will you advise a parent be it male or female to be in an abusive marriage, knowing fully well that it's having a negative impact on the children. Because if you follow the trend of conversation that is happening around this issue, it's clear that the children were also affected on the issue of synergy. So we're talking about uh, protecting children. So will you advise 
either of the partners to be in that kind of uh, relationship or marriage be uh, as it may be so what could possibly be a solution to this kind of situation going forward let's hear from 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 them regarding this issue because it's not just about the partner it's also about the children thank you uh thank you so much uh, damaris for that great question concerning uh abusive marriage and i can see this question is directed to bishop direct so bishop okay. will answer this later uh let's take another person i can see ruth you are raising your hands you can unmute yourself and share your thoughts okay good afternoon everybody i'm ruth i'm from cameroon um my question is related this with the same thing the last uh, question that was asked now we have and we've noticed or in count in our country especially in africa we have cultural issues that do not see gender-based violence as a problem now from the religious perspective we are made to understand that um, divorce biblically or leaving your partner comes in maybe it should be accepted only when you find your your partner in adultery which still um forgiveness comes to clear that up but in situations of gender-based violence like something that affects both the, the, the spouse and the children protecting the children how can that be handled how what would the clergy and the religious leaders what would they advise women in that situation to do would they say because of christianity or because of a belief or of uh, the church irrespective of the religion no you have to endure you have to stay quiet you have to keep praying like what uh, uh, late sister was that she went through enduring and all uh, until death. It, 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 are we going? What what are we going to say? Because right now, yes, from this example, we will be able to um, propagate and this both in the churches and um, out of the churches to make the men to understand or make the women to understand the kind of marriages they get into. But now in situations where spouses, some spouses are still undergoing such treatments, what are the advices? What are the advice that the clergy and the, the, lead, the Christian leaders on the platform now, what are they going to advise these women to do? Uh, thank thank you. you so much Ruth, for your question. We are highly appreciated concerning the cultural issues and the GBV and how can the religious leaders uh, advise uh, the survivors or victim to address this matter or in the reporting part of it. Thank you, we highly appreciate. The last person uh, I can see in a web, I don't know if I have, I have pronounced it correct, please take over. Yes, good afternoon everybody, um, Nadesh from Cameroon. Um, my question goes to the bishop there. I want to ask, because he's the only bishop, I don't know, I, I omitted knowing the bishop from which religious faith, because I was just reading to the Osinach death. It's just one of those death that to, it's loud today because it's, she's, a, she's, a, she's, she's a star, let's say. She's a public figure. But many women which have been victim to have died, which have been witnessed victim to have died when it comes to domestic violence. And it's the church, I think, has killed most of these women with, the, with Psalms 91, Psalms 40, and all these Psalms that talk about women sh should not leave their marriages. Now, I'm asked, my question to the bishop is, during counseling, do, big, do men of God or pastors, reverends, take time to educate couples on, on GBV, on gender-based violence, on domestic violence. Because I think that during counseling, it's all about submissiveness, it's all about adultery, it's all about all these other things. But I don't, I, do, do men of God, ministers of God really take time to 
educate the man and the woman, especially men, how to control their emotional intelligence or how to guide them to take care of their homes. And my uh, my second input is not a question, but I would like that when it comes to church, I think the church should have one voice because today, as I was said, I was reading, the Catholics have their own standpoint on when it comes to divorce. They have reasons according to your scriptures, which is scriptoria because I was surprised to see scriptures that back up claims in the Bible, but we have never seen them because we don't, we, we have not gone in there to search. Catholics have their own doctrine on divorce. Presbyterians, which I am, have uh, our own doctrine on divorce. Um, I went to the Quran. I read they have their own too about divorce. Then these other, uh, the churches, um, this, uh, how do they call them? Uh, Pentecostal churches, they have their own idea and their own idea is mostly based on adultery. So I think that as men of God, as ministers who are preaching the word of God, let them have one seed. Let them come together and not divide the house of Christ because it's this division in faith that I think that at the end of the day gets confusing and people don't really believe in what the Bible has to say or what Christianity has to say all it's all about. Because if the church is divided, we cannot, there's no way the church and if we as Christian adults are all divided when it comes to the word of God, we cannot transmit anything to children because those children, as the bishop said, we were all children yesterday and today we are adults. If we cannot have children that we can raise so well, if we cannot be correct adults, we cannot be correct parents. And tomorrow we'll have a continuity of children that will continue the damages that we are causing today. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I highly appreciate it. So we are remaining with 15 minutes. I would like to give a maximum of 10 minutes to all speakers. And we would like to merge uh, this session between the question and answer uh, and also the call to action. So to the speakers, you each have two minutes to answer the, some of this question and also to give us a call to action and key messaging which we can use uh, for advocacy purpose. So I can see Velvet uh, raise her hand. Uh, Velvet, you can take over. Two minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes. So basically for me, um, the conversation um, around, and I like that Marisa's question, because when we were talking about the conversation on policies, we did mention the fact that as institutions, we're not trying to um, speed the denomination. Bishop Tyler mentioned there are different faith entities that are tackling um, the issue of violence against children and sexual exploitation. Of course, it comes from cultural backgrounds and be beliefs that can transcend through um, the, you know, the family settings. And I'll still go back to you know, my, my initial thought process around tackling you know, violence. One of the things that I realized is that most churches or most faith entities, institutions around us do not have necessary policies in place that harness or direct the conversation. We talk about the universal declaration of human rights. We have child rights laws, children's rights here and there. We have um, conventions that have been signed to protect children in war setting, in set, you know, in at home. We have family law. We have all of those things in place. But the question is, how are we eventually, you know, channeling those conversations through the institutions that are already in place? Bishop Tala mentioned that the church, for instance, has access, direct access to thousands and thousands of people because we can converge regardless of what cultures we are, regardless of what traditions I personally practice. But we converge in church. A church has representation, just say Cameroon, for instance, the church has a representation of 200 ethnicities, people from different cultural settings. So what we're saying is that there's a potential here 
of the institutions in place to educate and reform. And by educating and reforming, as you can see on my slide, is besides the school curriculums, what are the churches doing? So we're encouraging the church to include and insert these conversations that would raise awareness on child rights issues. I mentioned around the policy, the fact that I personally am convinced that if you're working directly with children, or if you're directly um, or indirectly volunteered or paid working in a church or a faith institution, any program that concerns children, I personally think that you should be in a position to take some level of child protection training because it comes from those levels. Sometimes it's ignorance. And if we insert child protection training in our policies, in how we run our things, we will be able to curb some of those things because we will come to the church as our first base of, of learning and we'll be able to see some of these things that are going wrong. I insist again, of course, we're talking about protecting the women and we're, I know everybody has been passionate about you know, the, the Nigerian um, minister who just passed, but beyond that Nigerian minister, we clearly in my presentation, laid out instances where we have children in our communities, where we send them to our parents, our colleagues, our friends' homes. These are children that we send there. They don't have to be in church to face violence. They don't necessarily, but we are sending them and putting them at risk every single day. What are we doing in terms of, you know, our communities, in terms of our faith, in Why terms not? of where we're putting our information? to learn some of these things. And, you know, of course, we're talking about the religious institutions in place, but I remain on, you know, I firmly believe that we can play multiple roles. The faith institutions can play multiple roles. The same way we educate on, re on reform in radio stations, churches can relay that information to the radio stations that will go beyond just what I believe in as a person and beyond just what I'm hearing in church. I can carry it on my traditional media and it will now match to support. So I feel like we have multiple levels through which all these institutions can come to support and tackle sexual experience, but specifically to how we're addressing the issues that concern children. Thank you so much, Bevelet. Uh, Moses, do you, uh, would you like to share something in line with, with the question which has been uh, presented with participants? You have exactly two minutes to share anything you like to share to answer the question and call to action. Moses? Oh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, in regards to violence against children, I think everyone has to be responsible. We have to take responsibility as individuals, as a family, and as a faith community. And when I talk about faith community, every faith community, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Jewish, just name them, because we are a society. And like I said in my presentation, we cannot win this battle without considering or understanding the culture in which we belong to. So from our culture, we'll be able to transmit whatever value we want to transmit using either the gospel or using the Quran or whatever other faith um, uh, community. And for the call to action, I will say, we must not stop talking. However, we must talk and do. We must act as we talk. And two things, we must create awareness and we must collaborate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Moses, for your brief uh, call to action and some response to those questions. Uh, the next person, Omotoke, do you have anything to share? You have two minutes only to share, to answer some of these questions and also share the call to action. Omotoke? I'm not okay. Are, are you with us? Yes, I am. Sure. You have two minutes to share your inputs. Um, okay. Um, for me, I'll say that just like what we did today, we'll continue to, you know, hold conversations around this, we continue to talk about it, we continue to um 
ensure that we hold religious body accountable and um, we take actions. I think just like what um, uh, they said, we continue to take actions because we could talk, you know, we could talk from now till tomorrow, we could talk, we could hold meetings, we could do trainees, we could do stakeholders meeting, you know, we could like do a whole lot of things, but then they just remain wet if we all don't go out and, you know, put this into action. And mostly, let's stop judging victims. You know, I think that is one of the major problems that we have the attitude and the comment that comes from people when people finally come out as either um, victims of gender-based violence or sex trafficking or even children that have been, you know, violent, um, that, that have been as a, um, as a result of all this gender-based violence and what they've passed through. The first thing you hear is, oh, this thing happened to you a um, few years ago, why are you just coming out now? This thing happened to you 10 years ago, why are you just talking about it now? For different people, it takes a number of time for them to heal, for them to you know, have the enough self-esteem to even talk about it. Um, I tell people we have different strengths, we heal at different um, stage, at different degree. Some people, they come to that, you know, that stage whereby if anything happens to them, they are so bold about talking about it. They take to their social media to talk about it. Quite some people, it's going to take them a quite number to now talking about it. So let's just, you know, in our space, let's go ahead with this idea that sometimes people are so, you know, they must talk. Talk. When people are not ready to talk, you can't force them to talk. Sometimes we can only provide support for them, and that support could be in terms of um, houses for them to stay, in terms of financial support, in terms of counseling, in terms of training, in terms of advocacy and awareness. Yeah, so thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for sharing uh, your deep insight on what's okay. The next person is Reverend. I can see there's a lot of questions uh, asked uh, to you. I add you extra minutes. So Reverend Tala, you have three minutes to respond to some of these questions and share some call to action. Back to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sharon. All right, uh, I think uh, I have three questions and uh, all the three questions are, are similar because they, they flow into each other. So I'm just going to answer the three questions at once. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the Christian community, I think that the Bible is a final authority. But we have a divergence sometimes, like uh, Nadash uh, talked about, we have divergence sometimes in the way we interpret scripture uh, because uh, we, we tend to look at, at scripture from uh, a, a perspective. Uh, which sometimes uh, does not really reflect the original intent of the giver of the text, that is God himself. Because I, I'm not a law expert, but in law, uh, there is uh, this thing of the spirit of the law, that they would tell you that this is a text and this is the spirit of the law. That's a concept that is also very much present in the Bible. Uh, someone that Apostle Paul said, uh, the, spirit the, 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 the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Yes. So there are a couple of scriptures that I want to share on this issue of uh, divorce and uh, gender-based violence and all the like. Now, one question was, can we as religious leaders comfortably advise divorce, especially in cases where there are abuses? I would say yes. Not only in cases of marital unfaithfulness, there are so many other passages, for example, uh, we have uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13. Even though when you read that scripture, it talks about uh, a believing uh, woman being free to leave an unbelieving man if the man is not pleased to live with her. But the spirit of that text simply uh, is to make it clear that marriage is not a do or die affair. And in a situation where one of the party 
feels as if their lives are being threatened. Their freedom is being threatened. That party has every right to leave that marriage. That is the spirit of that text. Marriage is not a do or die affair. It's just a relationship like any other relationship. What the scripture does is to put guidelines so that we don't abuse of some of the privileges that God has given us because marriage is a privilege. Now, the next scripture we can be looking at is uh, Exodus uh, uh, 21, verse 9 to 10. Now, that scripture, if you read the scripture itself, it speaks of a situation where uh, a man can have a slave lady uh, in his home, and after some time, when the lady comes of age, he decides to give the lady to his son. So if the son, after some time, decides that he's no more pleased in the lady, and he stops giving her her food, giving her her marital right, that person says the lady is free to walk out of that marriage. Now, that is the text. But what is the intent? What is the spirit? What is the mind of the giver of that text? The spirit of that text simply says that if a man becomes abusive, uses economic means as a tool to molest or maltreat his wife, the lady has every right to leave that marriage. And you see, sexual abuse and explo exploitation is a matter of, uh, of power, you know, inequality in power. And that is what 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 addresses. Uh, for this, let me just read that text. He said, like, likewise, he husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife and unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. What that passage is talking about there is not, uh, yes, the text talks about wife, but the context is about how you deal with weaker vessels in a relationship. It may be a child, it may be a woman, it may be a dependent. So that place makes it clear that if you abuse of your power, abuse of your authority and privileges, even the prayer you pray will be an abomination in the ears of God. So I, I think that uh, we ministers of the gospel, we need to do a lot when Find it comes out. to, okay, the way we interpret scripture. All right, thank you, Aaron. thank you. My time is up, right? Yeah, you can just wind up with some few seconds. Uh, okay, yeah, so I think that with the proper interpretation of scripture, we can solve most of this problem. That's why Hosea 4, 6 say, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And we have a lot of problems today, the body of Christ, because just any body from anywhere comes up with his or her own interpretation. But I think, the bottom line is simple. If you understand God, you will understand scripture. God is all about love, mercy, and justice. These are three cardinal points. You go from there, you can't get it wrong. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for joining our, our today's session. Thank you everyone for being part of this great discussion. We highly appreciate for our speaker, we highly appreciate for participants to ask questions and also some few recommendations. We will all document this and we will share some of the documentation after, after this session. I've been informed in the next five minutes, we will, there's another session from different colleagues who would like, who would like to join. That's why I had to be so strict on time. Uh, just to give a quick communication, on Friday, we will have another session with the same topic, same goals, but with focus with the Horn of Africa. This will have a lot of panels. Some, so we will have a lot of experts. We already have some few experts in this call who will be joining as our speakers in that call. We highly, we highly request you to also join so that you can monitor some common trends and see how best as Africa, we can take over this conversation and adopt the concept of interfaith engagement in addressing uh, sexual violence and violence against children. So we would like to take a very group a very good group uh, group photo. We are requesting if you can turn your video on for only one minute so that we take a very quick group photos. We will highly appreciate. So my colleague, Rachel, uh, you can be ready. So we are requesting if you can turn your video so that we quickly take a group photo for this session.
Rachel, if you're ready, let us know. And if you manage to take group, good photo, also let us know. I'm ready. We can all smile. Moses <laughs> also will appreciate if you can turn your video on. One more. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, we will send the recorded version of this event via your email. So if you don't have your email, make sure you put it in the, in the comments so that we send the recorded version of this session. Also, we will send a link for the Friday session so that you can also register and we'll give more updates concerning the session. Yeah, maybe Daniel, do you have any anything to share? I can say Gina is, is still not around. I, I'm, hello, everybody. I was not prepared to say anything today, but Gina has some problems, uh, technical issues to enter. So she excuses herself for not being here. But I just can say that thank you very much for the session. I, I learned a lot about uh, everything you uh, share with us. So thank you very much, and uh, we will see you, I think, tomorrow and Friday. Thank you so much, Daniel. We highly appreciate for your presence uh, to represent Gina. So this is the end of our session, and see you on Friday, same time, 